Hello everybody, it's Colin Ellis here and welcome to another, yet another, Culture and Coffee podcast uh, for Monday the 15th of May 2023. And today I'm going to be talking about the, the six pillars of great culture um, because I had the, the privilege to work with a team in, in Austria last week who... Uh, just I've just got the right approach to doing culture so I want to talk about what those six pillars are and give you some things to think about some things that maybe you can do uh, with your team uh, now so I'm kind of veered away from what I would normally do coffee wise for those are regular listeners you know I like my um, special coffees that I like my single um, origins but given that I'm away sometimes the options are a bit limited and in hotel rooms, they offer Nespresso's. So I figured I would give it a go. I usually have like a bag of coffee that I buy in, in Australia or wherever I am. And I buy this little contraption called a Swiss Gold. And you basically scoop the coffee in and you put the little lid on top. I, I keep saying I'll talk more about the Swiss Gold. I should do that. And that's what I would normally do. Um, but this morning I have gone for an espresso. Uh, so an espresso, if you didn't know... Uh, it was founded in 86, it's been around for a while now, it's been over 30 years now. Um, 86 when Everton had a good football team, there you go. Uh, they're a Swiss company, and it was actually, it, it's a really interesting story actually. Eric Favre, who worked for Nestle at the time, was in Rome. And he couldn't understand why there were kind of lots of people in one coffee bar, but not as many in another coffee bar and basically you know he kind of watched what they were doing it was all down to how they pumped the piston which if you know anything about coffee the the pumping action kind of pushes water and air into ground coffee and that releases the flavor and when you you know you see that little crema on top of the coffee it's you know kind of uh, the uh, pushing of the water and the air through ground coffee so he then took that back and it, listen, it took him a while to perfect this machine with somebody other, Gaudillion, I think. There's another guy that he worked with to really perfect this to try and bring what he saw as authentic Italian coffee into the home, which he's done and they're a huge organisation now. They, the, the patents right now, I think, I want to say in the early 2010s, I read about it a while ago, and uh, as a result, you've seen, you know, for a few people copy them. And so they've got the, so each capsule is made of aluminium. And then when you kind of push the thing down on the machine, this sounds very scientific, doesn't it? When you push the thing down on the machine, it basically pumps hot water into the, there's like injector holes at the back of the capsule. And if you look at the very top of the capsule, you'll see like these tiny, tiny little holes, right? So that then, you know, it, it forces the water through the back and then it drips through the holes. So almost, you know, you're injecting the water and the air into air into the ground coffee. I'll criticize for the way that I said the word care last week. C A R E. I think not criticized. Play. It was playful. It was fine. Um, yeah. So when you're from Northern England, you say cur. So like a cat would purr, cur. Uh, people like cur, cur. Yeah. So care. So yes, push the air through the capsule, and that's how you get your coffee. That's how you get your coffee. Um, simple as that, really. Uh, but it sounds simple, but obviously it took years to uh, perfect. It's come like Nespresso. A lot of flack for its sustainability. I read a statistic that only 25% of capsules globally are actually recycled. So more needs to be done. And I know the organization itself um, says that it's capacity to recycle 100% of its capsules during the program. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really down to the individual to actually do that. Um, it's also doing a lot for the coffee industry as well. Um, what it's doing, you know, it's got a program where they're restoring coffee agriculture in, in particularly in regions that are affected by conflict and, and hardship and disasters. So, you know, they're, they're trying to do their bit. But I don't, I don't, I have to say, I, this would be the first Nespresso coffee I've had in a very long time. Anyway, I'm going to give this a go. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is this is a Levanto um, coffee, and there's just a bitterness to it, and and maybe that's just a product of the machine itself. Um, so it's just like a, I suppose it's just like a medium roast coffee, I suppose. Um, yeah, there's just a there's just a bitterness to it. I imagine if you're if you're drinking espresso, espresso with milk. Uh, I imagine you don't really taste much much of a difference, um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of caramelly, I suppose. Um, yeah, not not really my thing. Anyway, I thought I'd just give it a go. Why not? Let's talk about the six pillars of great culture. So yeah, worked with a client last week. So I've been working with them for about a year, and what we've dis what we spent that year doing is kind of reviewing. For those who regular listeners, I have I have maybe three or four clients that I work with globally on the culture. People who want something different, want something specific, but want something that works, right? And so I go in and I'll review the way that they do things. I'll, I'll see how much culture stuff that they've got. Some companies got lots of culture stuff, vision, mission, purpose, values, behaviors, all of these things. And, and you know, kind of look at how they all work together and whether they need more culture stuff, less culture stuff, or whether there's a, a refinement of messaging, um, uh, which is often the case. You know, in this particular instance, the organization has got all of the foundations in place, got a really, they've got a leadership team who are committed to culture. And by committed, I mean that, when they say they're doing it, they're actually doing it. And it doesn't get deprioritized, you know, ahead of other things, you know, and when, you know, when, when sales, you know, aren't where they need to be, they double down on culture, right? So what they don't do is drift away from the kind of behaviors they want to see. And so, you know, when you've got a leadership team like that, it really helps everybody else to kind of you know, feel the same way, you know, and, the, and for this particular client, it was, it was really more about an education program. And I worked with the, the global learning and development team who were just awesome to work with. Um, and we, we kind of put together what, what you would call, I suppose, an education day on, you know, kind of what does culture mean for this particular organization? What are its strengths? What are its opportunities? Helping people to talk about culture. So this was the global general management team helping them to talk about culture. And there was a real, there was a real desire to know more. Again, you know, when 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 you're working with a, a room full of people with that growth mindset, it just, I don't know, that you, it, it's very easy to then kind of look at it and go, oh, this is why your culture's good. This is why the organisation's successful. And I think... You know, often I'll work with organisations who are either at the top of the game and want to stay at the top of the game, or who perhaps have lost their way and they want to get back. The cultures that are fundamentally broken generally bring in a firm of consultants to charge them a million dollars to tell them what they already know. Um, so I kind of work with the, the cultures that slightly lost their way and like, oh, we want to get back to where we where we um, would like to be, or organisations want to stay at the top of the game. Anyway, so the six pillars, which is something that I wrote about in Culture Fix. And they are relevant for every company in every country, in every sector in the world, these six pillars. Now, it, of course, they're unique to every country and they're unique to every company. All right. No, no culture is the same culture as your competitive advantage. It can't be copied. It can't be copied. You know, even though you might bring someone like me in to give you some new ideas and give you some things that other people are doing, I won't necessarily name them, but give you some inspiration. And you still can't copy them. They still have to be yours. But all companies have these. So I'm just going to take you through them. Now, it's worth mentioning at this stage that even if you're a manager of a small team, you can do these six things. I think often what the mistake that managers make is that is they wait for permission to do culture. You don't need permission to do it. Something that I did myself as a manager in, in the private and the public sector as a government employee, I would take my team off site for two days and we would agree these things. And we would talk about what it would take to incorporate them because I knew, having seen it and having worked in those teams when I was a you know kind of very junior manager, if you get the culture right, then the results follow. You know, it's you know it's it, there's, it's I've said in the past, it's not rocket science. It's a lot of hard work, uh, but when you teach people how to build culture and you teach people, you know, kind of what are those core elements of culture, then they get it. You know, I have a I have a, a program where I teach people how to 
teach managers how to build culture. And almost everyone always says, this would have been great at the start of my career. I was like, yeah, right, me too. It would have been great at the start of my career. Um, so what are the six elements? Well, the first one is, is personality and communication. So this is about you understanding yourself and each member staff and themselves and some themselves as individuals. And whilst, yes, we want great collaboration, which I'll get onto in a minute, we need everybody on the team to understand who they are, what they're about, what their strengths are, what their opportunities for improvement are. Ultimately, what we want is everyone to get up every single day with the right attitude. And, and that lives inside of all of us. So we need to understand ourselves in order to be able to do that. You know, the best teams have got self-aware, self-motivating individuals to begin with, and then they can contribute to the team. So the personality and communication piece, and the reason that it's the first pillar is it's the way into any team. It, you know, the team can never be successful if you don't have self-aware people. You know, I, there's, there's a great book that I read by a guy called Martin Newman. He talked about emotional capital. And emotional capital is where you take the time to build relationships with other people, which is exactly what we're talking about here. And there's five components to that, so if I can remember them. So the first one was self-awareness. So it's you understanding yourself, your strengths, your opportunities for improvement. The second one was self-management. It's kind of that recognition of how you feel and then being able to regulate your responses based on that. The third one was social awareness. So being aware of the world around you, kind of what's happening around you. And, you know, in our digitally distracted world, I don't think enough people are looking up metaphorically um, to be more social aware. The fourth one is social skills. And that, this is not saying that you have to be a mad, crazy extrovert, but you do have to not only understand the importance of building relationships with others, but you kind of have to understand how to go about it, right? And you also have to understand that kind of mixing socially is really important for culture. And then the last thing is adaptability, is, is you recognising that you're never going to stay the same. Often when I do personality profiling as part of my programmes, people will say, oh, I did one of these 10 years ago. I'm like, dude, if you're the same person that you were 10 years ago, you've done something terribly wrong. You know, we grow, we mature, we learn all of the time. So personality is important. So is communication. You've got to know how to communicate with people who aren't you. Otherwise, what we get is communication breakdown. So that's the first pillar is personality communication. So an activity that you can do is with your teams is to spend some time getting to know each other. If you've got a personality profile that you've used, maybe. Uh, listen, they're not an exact science, but they're a good start. But just get people to share a little bit about who they are, how they like to be communicated to, um, you know, and, and, and use that as the basis for decision making. So that's the first pillar. Then at the heart of every great culture is a vision or purpose. This is pillar number two. So purpose is the role that we want to play in the world. So it's pretty much a statement of, you know, kind of the organization that we are whereas vision is really all about aspirations what do we want to achieve and your purpose is generally something that doesn't change very often but your vision will change in line with strategy so vision informs strategy which informs goals and and from that we build a culture to deliver the strategy but it, it's all aligned to the actual vision Vision purpose is not a set of goals. Some people often make the mistake of, you know, we want to be the number one HR team in the world, right? Okay, good. But, you know, that, you know, as a goal, that's very, very aspirational. What's the thing that you need to do first? You know, what's your immediate vision? You know, and, and that's, you know, kind of probably the end step. You know, I worked with a team recently, really, you know, great team. The goal is to kind of win marketing team of the year. Um, and that's great. That's an aspirational goal. And then you can define a cult, an aspirational vision. And then you can define the series of goals that you need to attain in order to get and achieve that, that vision. Um, I worked with one sport. I'm trying to think. There's a sports team that I worked with. And their vision was to play as one with a winning mindset, which I really liked. Right, that's the vision because they felt that they were a team of good individuals but they weren't playing as one team and a, a winning mindset was something that they didn't all have. So that was the vision, that was the aspiration and then we defined the culture in order to achieve that vision. 
So vision and purpose is the second pillar. The third pillar is values. Now, values, they're not single words. People like, you know, value collaboration, integrity, I see these words, innovation. They're not values, right? Mostly they're behaviours. Innovative is a behaviour. Collaborative is a behaviour. Empathetic is a behaviour. These aren't values. Values are the, the, the you know, short statements. They're like ideals that the employees will then strive to fulfil. The cultural norms then are the kind of, principles of collaboration are the way that we actually live those in plain sight but really for for, for values to mean anything they must be complemented by those day-to-day -day norms that link to behavior and collaboration but i'll come to that in a second um so you know different organizations have have uh, different values so you know uh, uh, australian software company at lassie and have you know values like play with heart and balance Cool. So what's the behavior that we need to demonstrate? What's the collaboration principle that we need to do to make sure that we're playing with heart and balance? And for me, values are, are things that you live in plain sight. You know, if you paint them on the wall, well, that's great. But actually, it's better if, you know, you're able to demonstrate them to each other on a day to day basis. Um, often, I think with values is that they never turn into behaviors because we're never specific enough about how to practice the value, if that makes sense. You know, you can have a, you can have a value as empathy as standard, yeah, which is fine, right? If you feel that that's something that the organization values, but what does that mean? Like in practice, what does empathy as standard mean? And so turning the, the, the name of the value into the very specific action, that, that's where the magic happens right there all right so that that you know for me the values are really really important and when you hire people you hire people for a values match you know i when i ever talk about this organizations they'll say oh hire for culture fit but culture subjective it means different things to different people whereas when you hire for values match you're getting someone that values the same things that you do and that's really really important because then you know if we have that if we if we share the similar values in terms of what we're looking for for the organization then culturally it'll be it'll be um, a lot easier for us to win whatever your definition of winning is so values is the third pillar the fourth pillar is behavior so in an, in an ideal world we wouldn't have to tell people how to behave they would just know unfortunately this is not an ideal world and so in order to achieve our vision and to live our values in plain sight, we have to agree what are those core behaviours that we're going to demonstrate towards each other. Now, as a manager, you know, what you can't afford to do is dictate any of this stuff. Some, you know, often senior leaders will make that mistake. They'll go away for a day. They'll decide the vision. They'll decide the behaviours. They'll decide the values. They'll come back and they'll tell people what they are. And what, what will happen, guaranteed, I see it time and time again, is people will like, they're not, they're not my values. I wasn't involved in that. That's not my vision. That's not what I believe. Who came up with these? Whereas when you involve the team in them, you're giving them the opportunity to contribute. It's their culture. It's up to them to define it. As a leader, you're part of that. But behavior is really about, you know, kind of our expectations of each other as human beings. It includes things like roles and responsibilities so that people are really, really clear about what they're responsible for. It includes things like recognition and reward. It's always that way around. And what you want to do is recognize the behavior. That's the thing that you reward because if you recognize the behavior, you get more of the behavior from other people. If you put the people who behave really well in line with the values or kind of front and center and say, this is why we're rewarding them. And it might be a little trophy. It might be, I don't know shout and lunch or take them for coffee or something. I don't know. It doesn't have to be a boat, you know. Uh, it doesn't have to be cash. Definitely not. Um, but when you do that, you get more of the behaviour. But, you know, for me, behaviour is crucially important. You're, you're only ever as good as the behaviour that you choose to walk past. So uh, if someone's behaving poorly, it needs to be dealt with immediately. I, I, I had a conversation with a guy a few weeks back. And he was like, oh, we've got these cultural issues, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, long story short, there's one person behaving badly. I was like, if you don't deal with that person, 
if you don't performance manage them, you send a message to everybody else that that behavior is acceptable. Oh, I know. I know we've got to deal with it. I was like, you've got to deal with it right now. And once you deal with that little element within the culture, you'll find that other people are like, oh, they'll either be, they'll either say, A, finally, we're actually doing something about this, or and or B, the culture will change as a result of dealing with that individual. And sometimes you just have to get rid of people. Now, when I say get rid of people, I don't mean, you know, take them out of the field and just leave them for dead. I mean, put them in the performance pathway channel. And, you know, some, some people just have to leave to safeguard the culture. Too many, too many managers compromise the culture for one individual, for one brilliant jerk. So behavior is the fourth pillar. The fifth pillar is collaboration. So how we work together, can't leave it to chance, right? Just because you've got Microsoft Teams doesn't mean pe people are collaborating. So collaboration is about systems, processes. Um, it's about the technology that you use. It's about the workspace, how you think about the workspaces, how we bring them together, you know, what materials have they got? Um, I think it, you know, particularly at the minute, I see a lot of people using technology really badly. I've mentioned this on the podcast before is where you've got people sending you emails with a link to a Teams message. Did you see that? You know, stuff like that is just you know, so inefficient, so in, ineffective in, in communicating. You know, so what you can do is agree a bit of a charter. You know, what do you use email for? What do you use Teams for? What do you use when something a video call, when something an audio call? You know, really do think about how you're going to collaborate and don't make everything a meeting. You've got workshops, you've got one-to-ones, you've got stand-ups, you've got all of these things. You've got chat tools, you've got WhatsApp groups, right? Is is Don't make everything a meeting. If you are going to have meetings, remember they're for information sharing or they're for decision making. No, no meeting should be more than 20 minutes or 40 minutes. Like I've heard, you know, some senior leadership teams have three-hour meetings. Well, that's a workshop. For me, if you're having a three-hour meeting... You're not doing enough work to prepare for the meeting before you go in. Most senior leadership teams end up reading papers that they were sent the day before. Well, actually, if you're doing your meetings really well, the papers are with you three days before you've had time to read them. You're going into the, the room, you're making the decisions, bish, bash, bosh, you're done in 40 minutes. It sounds so obvious. Um, and you're probably thinking, oh, that's unachievable with this leadership team. It's not unachievable as someone who's done it. Uh, myself and someone who encourages it with, with clients and see them dramatically change the way they do things. One of the teams that I work with challenged themselves to get every 30 minute meeting down to 15 minutes and they did it in two months. And now their standard meeting time is 15 minutes. Um, but collaboration really is the art of working together to produce forward momentum. Keep that in mind. If you feel like you're treading water or you're going backwards, if you feel like you're being swamped by Teams messages and emails, you're doing collaboration wrong. There's got to be regular forward momentum, and I don't just mean in the evenings at weekends, right? Now, if you're bringing people back together in offices, make sure they've got time for quiet work as well as collaboration. Don't bring people back to the office and have back-to-back -back meetings that they could do at home, right? Bring people back and make some conscious decisions about what you're going to do differently. So collaboration is the fifth pillar. The last one, the sixth pillar is innovation. Something that organizations talk a lot about and don't aren't very good at doing because they think innovation is huge product development. No, not necessarily. What we're talking about is the small things. It's the little things that you can do every day to improve the conditions within which you work. That's innovation. So it's about gathering data. How long does that process take? You know, how useful was that report? That's you know, how many people read it? Um, you know, what system do we use for what? Have we got duplication? Little things like that. You know, also every time you make a mistake or there's failure, you know, what did you learn from it? I don't believe you should celebrate failure, but but what did you learn from it so they can do things differently? But for me, ultimately, innovation is, is about making time for creativity. Um, and I think I've shared on the podcast, it might have been a while ago, actually, that me and my teams, we used to, we used to have two hours uh, for creativity every week between three and five on a Friday. Why between three and five on a Friday? Because at that point, we were kind of looking forward to spending the weekends with friends and family. Uh, and it's a perfect time just to go, what's an issue that we had this week and what can we do to challenge it? You know, what can we do differently? We didn't allow, 
kind of average ways of working, you know, couldn't bring your phone in. You know, we had to really think differently about how we did it. You know, we used whiteboards and post-it notes and all these kinds of things. And we came up with some stupid ideas, but actually some of those stupid ideas gave rise to some really good ideas. So how, you know, again, innovation about carving some time out of your week, every single week or every month, whatever works for you, just to be creative. Don't deprioritize it. Don't let anybody put anything in there. It's fun. Creativity is fun. Um, and the organizations that do it well have a constant pipeline of ideas to implement and their cultures never stagnate. I think just to wrap it up, the thing about the six pillars is you have to take the time to define them. You know, I would say this is 90% of the work that I do is working with organizations to either help them define the culture they need to be successful or teaching their managers how to do it themselves. That's, you know, that's the majority of my work, really. Great culture doesn't happen by accident. You know, it's not something that magically is like one day you've got this vibrant culture. You know, sometimes you get vibrant culture and you're doing four of the six pillars almost by accident. And then you add the other two and then all of a sudden you've got this constant vibrant culture. Um, so, yeah, so you really have to be deliberate about these six pillars. Generally, once a year, once every 18 months, or if you need to pump the tyres up on your bike, uh, you need to bring everybody together to agree them and away you go again. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. I uh, look forward to chatting next time. Ciao for now.